Hi again. In the last video, we studied how the King's Indian type 1 structure should be played as white. As you may remember, Black's inability to control the C-file or make use of it was one of the key factors in his defeat. In addition to that, in many variations, his space disadvantage made things difficult for him. Now, we will see some examples on how Black should play this pawn structure. Let's start with our first example. So far we are following a usual and relatively common opening line. And now we reach an interesting moment. White decided to play bishop h4. And this is a move that we should pay special attention to. He had to make a choice between going back to the g1, a7 diagonal, or staying in the h4, d8 diagonal. And this decision actually defines the character of the game in many ways. A bishop on h4 makes it harder for black to advance on the king side to pursue the standard king's indian attack. And then the bishop on the g1 a7 diagonal on the other hand is actually much more useful if the position were to become a king's indian type 1 structure, that is if the c pawns were to be traded. That's a key piece of information and black should make use of that. Now let's continue with the game. First, I mean, the game continued with knight b6, but let's for a moment consider what would have happened if f5. There are many options, but here white could, for example, take on f5. And notice that if black were to take with the pawn, you know, taking with the pawn is typically a desirable idea to cover the e4 square. But in this specific position, it doesn't work because of bishop h5. We are attacking the queen. The queen is essentially trapped. So the only way to save it is play rook f7, but that loses an exchange. Too bad. So going back a couple moves, after pawn takes, black would have to take with the rook. And uh, here white has many options, they are all kind of similar. So let's just see one of them. So it could be castle, knight dc5, bishop d4. Okay, so we get to trade the light squared bishops, that's typically good for white. And now white has a small advantage, because he will be able to place a knight on e4 in a comfortable way, and sooner or later he will be able to push b4 with a pretty good position. Notice that the bishop on g7 is not particularly useful. Now, let's go back several moves. Back to the game. So we just examined what would have happened if black tried to play f5. Now, in this position, black played knight b6. And now the game continued with b3, bishop h6, queen c2, and c6. Now, this is a nice decision for black. In this position, it actually does make sense to try and trade pawns on the c file because white is not well prepared to fight for it. First of all, I mean, notice the bishop on h6 kind of attacks the c1 square, which will sooner or later prevent white from placing a rook there. Now, in addition to that, notice that the knight on b6 is ready. If we ever were to trade these pawns, then when white tries to place a knight on c4, black can just trade it. So that knight is very well placed and that will help the d6 pawn, it will basically prevent the d6 pawn from becoming weak. Now the game continued, so castle, knight c5, rook b1. Now typically, I mean, white would like to play b4, this is a standard idea, but in this position it just doesn't work well, because a bishop takes d2. And then hoping that this is a trade, but actually black wins a pawn, this is not okay. And then the other possibility to take into account is after bishop takes, maybe queen takes, unfortunately it loses an exchange. So either way, b4 is not possible. White has to play rook b1 instead. Now some standard moves, and now black decided to finally trade pawns on d5. So technically, we are only reaching the king's indian type 1 structure now, after the trade. And this is a tactic that black has employed all along. You see, white can't force black to trade pawns on d5, but he must make every move, assuming that sooner or later the c file will become open. In the meantime, the c4 square was never available, white can't really put a rook and go all the way to c7 because the file is still closed, so it kind of puts white in a slightly awkward situation, he doesn't know exactly what to do. Now, at some point, which basically is now, black feels that he's completely ready to fight for the c file and that's when he decides to open it. 
Now he played bishop d7 with the idea to use the c file in the next move. You know, when you look at this position and you notice this bishop on h4, we can all agree that the bishop on h4 is just useless, at least right now. So you see, this is one of the reasons why this idea of playing c6 and trading on d5 was justified for black. Now the game continued with b4, knight a4, and here white had an option. He took on a5, but what if he had traded knights? And then check, and notice, now the rook on d1 is hanging. So, for example, if white had played knight, knight d3, then black can play queen b8. We might end up trading rooks, and this ending is definitely better for black. Notice that the bishop on h6 is preventing white from using the c file, and now if white were to play pawn takes, then I can just trade. Maybe I can hold on for a moment, playing f7 just to improve position a little bit. I'm threatening knight c5. I wasn't threatening knight c5 before because uh, white could have taken and then played check intermediate move, but, but now it's a threat because of this pin. So now white could move the rook away and now I can trade. And this is a very pleasant position for black. Now black can just play knight c5 next move and then double rooks on the a file. So he can pursue two targets, a3 and e4. I mean, he could play for a win, maybe it will be a draw. He's definitely not going to lose. So it's an ideal scenario for black. Now let's go back a few moves. In this position, white had another interesting idea, which was to play knight c4. And that would have been maybe the critical variation, because after bishop takes and rook takes, white gets some kind of reasonable compensation for the exchange. The position is complicated, but the point is that here the d6 pawn is going to be lost. And then black at the moment lacks entry points. So even though he has an extra exchange, he doesn't have an ideal way to use it yet. Now let's go back to the game. In this position, black played the knight to a4, which is quite standard. It kind of helps to relieve some of the space disadvantage because now at least a piece is going to get traded. Now here, white took on a5, and black had a very nice move, queen c8. And at this point, it kind of becomes clear that, that it is white who has to fight for the equality. Now the game continued, rook c1, trade. And here, maybe white could have tried to just trade everything, or trade as much as possible. But unlike the examples that we saw in the first video here, it is black who can play for a win. I hope the reasons are relatively clear. First of all, I mean, the rook is relatively active here. I mean, there is an actual target to attack. A knight might be coming to c3, which is very unpleasant. And the key thing, the bishop on h6 prevents the rook from being useful. So black can play this position for a win without major risks. This is why white didn't want to go for this. So instead, he decided to play queen b3. Now, rook c5, nice move. And uh, here, white has to take. I mean, what else is he going to do? He cannot go away. He could have played rook c4, but then I can just play b5 with black. So we go back to the same situation. So here, white took on c5. And now, black had an interesting decision to make. He could have taken with the queen, and that might have been even stronger than what happened in the game. Now, the b7 pawn is not a pawn that you can actually capture, because if you take queen takes b7 after rook f7, knight c3 is a major threat. For example, if you play knight b1, hoping to hold everything, then bishop g4, just on time. And now white has to make a very unpleasant decision. He could either give up the queen, hoping to survive, which he can't, because of queen c2, King f1 and bishop c1. That's a win. Notice how the knight is going to be lost. And then the other possibility would have been to play after bishop g4, queen a6, and then rook a7, queen d3, knight b2. And then suddenly we are going to win an exchange, and then later we are going to win the game. So let's go back several moves. We were saying in this position, Taking with the queen might have been very promising. Now, what could white do? I mean, the main threat is knight c3, so maybe white can just play passive. Knight b1, now we play b5. And now, this is the moment where we can really see how miserable white's position is. He doesn't even have a, like a truly useful move. 
all he can really do is kind of move around. So maybe rook f1, bishop c1, you know, just because we can. It's a nice move. And now king h2. I mean, the idea of this is to maybe play f3 and then bishop f2. It's quite slow, but at least he can kind of untangle a little bit. But now black can just play rook c8, queen c2. Queens are traded. And you see, black is in full control of the board. I mean, the bishop essentially keeps that knight tied to b1 because he has to protect the pawn on a3. Now black controls that part of the board and may continue to increase the pressure by gaining space. So he might play f5, f4, or maybe play h5 and h4, or something of that sort. The point is that black here has a big advantage because he controls the board and he can play for a win without real risks. Now let's go back and see what happened in the game. After rook takes e5, black took with the knight. Now the queen is under attack, so queen b4, bishop a4, and now white played rook e1. Rook c1 doesn't really make much of a difference because black can just play queen d7 and then the, the same thing is again. He's taken and then the e4 pawn is falling. F3 that doesn't work obviously because we just take it and then win an exchange. So going back a little bit, white here played rook e1 and now black was able to see the fruit of his superior strategy. He took and then managed to take the e4 pawn. So he is a pawn up, but now there are still some slight complications that need to be sorted out. So let me just show you a few more moves. Here black might have been tempted to play knight c5 but unfortunately that complicates the game and you can check this a little bit but after f4 you see some complications arise just to give you a sample variation pawn takes bishop f2 and you see in, in the last few moves it's like the nature of the game changed quite a bit but what we can see is that white managed to shuffle pieces around and suddenly things are more complicated so going back just a few moves in this position black found a very nice resource which was to play Queen c3, still a pawn up, but you know, he's giving it up and now he gains a very powerful initiative. So now again, this misplaced bishop has to pay the price because after g5 it is trapped. It can go to g3, but then a pawn would be lost back. So here white decided to go for rook c1, bishop f1, and after knight c3 some major losses are going to happen. So uh, white could have played rook a1, then rook c7, and the threat knight e2 is unstoppable. Either knight e2 winning or pawn takes bishop winning. In the game, white just took the knight and after queen c3, black has a decisive material advantage. Now, what's the message that you should take away from this game? To be really honest with you, there is nothing amazing about the way in which black conducted his queenside play after trading on d5. Now, the really important thing here was before when he decided that playing that trade on d5 in that specific moment would pay off. He knew that this pawn structure is very hard to play if you don't go into it in optimal conditions. One key moment was when he played f6. Remember early in the opening he played f6 and the bishop decided to go to h4. That was a major clue. Now, let's see the next example. Now, something interesting about this example is that we reached a closed King's Indian structure from a Sicilian. Now, let's see how this went. The opening is relatively standard and, you know, not particularly important for our purposes, so we just go through it relatively quickly. And here we are. So, the first thing to notice is that one minor piece is already off the board, which is a good thing for black. He usually struggles due to special problems, but now they will not be so severe. Now, on the other hand, white has a big plus, which is the knight on b6. For the moment, black is not allowed to use the c-file at all. And if that knight could stay there on b6 forever, that would be wonderful. Fortunately for black, I mean, he's not doing so poorly either. And right now he's probably thinking about playing bishop b5 and knight d7. So knight b5 kind of gains a tempo, attacks along the diagonal, and then the knight b7 is able to eliminate the knight. But here, if white had thought for a while and calculated a little bit, he could have found a very interesting opportunity. Bishop h6. 
bishop b5, knight c4. Okay, so this isn't much, but it basically allows white to keep slightly better chances. Black actually need, needs to be careful. For example, if we just play rook c8, rook c1, and then, well, I mean, black could maybe hope to double, but then after queen f3, you see black is stuck. He already doubled rooks, and now he can't really improve the position any further. And uh, now he actually needs to be careful. For example, you play knight e7, I can play h4. Interesting opportunity. And uh, white might try to get some play in the king side, or maybe just gain space. So maybe if I don't, don't see anything better, I might just play g3 and king g2 and then keep thinking. But at least I claim some more space for myself. Now, the, the point here, I mean, first of all, bishop takes h4 is suicidal because of knight takes, and then the f7 pawn is falling. Now, what if you just play b6 to try to untangle a little bit the queen side? Then I have this very nice resource. Pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes d6. Again, threatening queen takes f7. And here, you see, this is the point. Bishop takes d6, queen f6, bishop f8. So everything looks fine. White is a piece down. But now he can take uh, the bishop, still threatening mate. So black has to take back. And after trading rooks and queen d6, black is losing a rook in the game. Now, you see this is just a variation, but it kind of illustrates a lot of things. I mean, first of all, black's position is, is kind of delicate. And second thing is that typically when you have a good foundation, you know, a good strategic idea, then tactics tend to work out for you. Now, let's go back several moves. So what we were saying is, it looks like white gets to keep some advantage. But then black maybe could have avoided some of those problems by playing b6 right away, and then just queen takes b6. I mean, white could trade queens, but this is not going to work out well for him, because notice that that rook is coming along very fast. So instead, I mean, white can just play rook c1, and then after queen b7, I still prefer white's position a little bit, but there is counterplay, and there is only one pawn on the queen side. We will discuss that a little bit better in the future. Now, in the game, white played knight takes d7. I'm not very happy about that move. I feel that it helps black a little bit. Kind of helps to connect the rooks a little faster, and now this is all a race. Will white have enough time to establish a solid center that he can hold? For example, I mean, if white was able to play b3, he had time to play b3 and knight c4, that would be wonderful. He would have control of the center, control of an important square, and the c-file would be blocked and neutralized. That's good for white. But he can't really do that so easily here. I mean, knight c4 is punished by just queen b5. Now, if we play, for example, b3, okay, rook c2 doesn't work. We just play queen d3. And after queen c7, I mean knight c4, the rook is lost. Of course, I mean, black could just go back, but then we play knight c4 and we are happy. The point, though, is after b3, black has rook c3, which kind of allows him to gain some reasonable counterplay. So let's go back a couple moves. Here, white made a weak move, queen d3. I'm not sure what he was thinking of, but after queen c7, b3, I mean, he's hoping to play knight c4, but obviously, black can just play queen c2. Which is a very nice transition. You see, swapping the queens of the board wasn't essential, but the important thing here is that black gets to place a rook on the second rank, and also, after the queens are traded, the e4 pawn is a lot more vulnerable. Now, the game continued with f3, knight d7, b5. And here, there was another critical moment for white. I mean, things are already not looking so good for him. Two minor pieces are off the board, space advantage means nothing at this point, black controls the c-file, and so at this point he should be thinking exclusively about how do I improve my chances to make a draw. And definitely he should have taken on b6, because after knight takes, okay, black controls the board, but there's only one pawn on the queen side, and the fewer pawns on the queen side, the better the chances to make a draw say that, you know, maybe we will lose the b3 pawn at some point, but, you know, at least we only have to worry about one thing, that pawn on a6. In the game, white played b4, and now there are two things to worry about, losing b4 and later losing a5. So there are two things that can go wrong. The problem is that black dominates the game, so pretty much everything that can go wrong, 
will go wrong, and that's the problem. So here, Black played rook c8, he fully controls the board, and the position is nearly winning already. So let's just see how Black managed to impose this advantage. Game continues with rook e1, bishop g5, trade. Now, knight takes c1. Well, white could have taken on c1, but it wouldn't have made so much of a difference. After f5, this is pretty similar to the game. In the game, white took, and then f5, of course. It's a wonderful position for black, he controls the c file, and now he has time to attack the base of the pawn chain. Uh, taking is not very attractive, because the d5 pawn becomes weak, so instead, white decided to play knight e2. And this is the last move of the game. It is possible that white just lost on time, but he's definitely going to lose anyway. Let me show you a continuation. King f3, rook b2. And now white could try rook c1, hoping that this will give counterplay. Both pawns are falling, right? But here black has a very nice move, rook a4. The point is that he wants to take the pawn on a5, and obviously two connected pass pawns will be enough to win. Now, if white were to play rook takes a6, then check, check, and now white has to give up the knight. So going back a couple moves, white could try knight g3 to hold the pawn on e4 for a moment, but then we can just take on a5, and this is a decisive advantage for black. Overall, what happened in this game was Okay, first of all, we reached the key pawn structure from a different defense. That's an interesting thing to see. Second, when we began, black had a slightly more favorable situation because, well, one minor piece was off the board and then immediately white traded on d7, which was kind of an unfortunate decision because then a second minor piece was off and then things gradually became more favorable for black when he was able to take control of the c file. Overall, I hope that this video helped you to gain perspective on how black can fight, but I still hope you understand that this pawn structure tends to be a little bit more favorable to white, and the key for black to be successful is to decide in which situations it would be okay to trade on d5. That's the essence. You have to pick and choose and see. If the situations are suitable, then you can trade on d5, otherwise you go for a different pawn structure.